next week. So without further ado, we will get started. Uh, so for those of you who are not familiar with the Asthma Society, a little bit about us. Uh, the Asthma Society has been around since 1974, so we just celebrated our 40th anniversary last year. Uh, and we work to empower children's, uh, children and adults in asthma, or in Canada with asthma, to live an active and symptom-free life. Uh, as well, uh, as part of the Asthma Society of Canada, we have the National Asthma Patient Alliance. Uh, NAPA was established in 2007 uh, as a grassroots membership-based group. Uh, and so NAPA works to uh, increase patient awareness, to help achieve ideal asthma control, address communications and advocacy needs of people with asthma, uh, and we have representation across the country. I know we have a number of, the, of members from our uh, executive committee on the call today, uh, but our, our uh, executives uh, is spread out from across the country. We have 18 members, uh, and they uh, serve as the, uh, the steering committee for the work that we do uh, on behalf uh, of uh, the ASC and NAPA, and just some examples of some of the work that we've done in the past uh, including the Asthma Patient Bill of Rights. And some of you may be familiar with our Team Asthma program, which is our program uh, where we participate in organized races across the country, uh, walking and running to raise money for the Asthma Society, uh, our peer-to-peer -peer education and support program, which is the Asthma Ambassadors program, uh, as well as our variety of advocacy work. And here's just a little bit more about Team Asthma, and, and, and we will mention, of course, the, the importance of, of our Team Asthma program, especially uh, when it comes to this topic. Uh, we uh, have people across the country. We raise on average of 25,000 uh, a year, and in uh, the recent year, actually, uh, even more than that, uh, participating in organized events. So uh, this year, we'll be participating in race events in Montreal, Ottawa, Toronto, uh, Calgary, Halifax, and Vancouver. Uh, so if, they're, uh, if you are interested in, in running and, or walking uh, with our Team Asthma program, uh, please, uh, you can sign up online there, asthma.ca slash Team Asthma, or you can get in touch with either myself or uh, Jenna Reynolds uh, at, about how to participate. Uh, we do provide free race registration for people who are interested in uh, running or walking with Team Asthma. Uh, all we ask is uh, a commitment that people fundraise uh, for the Asthma Society. So before we get started, we just have a, a quick poll that we'd, we're going to ask uh, you to please uh, fill out. You should see it on your screen now. Uh, how do you best identify? Are you a parent or guardian of a child with asthma? Are you a person with asthma yourself? Are you a health professional or a patient advocate? Uh, or uh, do you not fall into one of those categories? So we'll give everyone a minute to, uh, to fill out this poll, and then uh, we'll look at the results. It looks like we have a, a fairly uh, balanced group. So we have uh, uh, almost uh, ha almost one third, one third, one third. So uh, parents and, and and children. We have five people uh, right now. 26% as well. People with asthma themselves, and then a slightly larger collection of uh, patient advocates and health professionals. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, you'll see uh, just you know we have a few facts about asthma, but I, I'm going to skip ahead so that we can talk a little bit about uh, what we're going to be doing today. So we're really pleased to be joined by uh, Dr. Joanna McLean uh, from the University of Alberta, uh, as well as David Tellis Langdon uh, from the University of Winnipeg, and both of them will be uh, giving a short presentation, and then we'll have an opportunity for uh, some conversation and, and questions following. So uh, just a reminder before we get into those presentations, if you have questions for our presenters, please enter them into the chat box on your screen, and uh, we'll have time for questions after each of the two presentations. So first, I uh, want to introduce Dr. Joanna McLean. Uh, Joanna is a pediatrics respirologist with the Division of Pediatric Respirology, Pulmonary, and Asthma at the University of Alberta and the Stollery Children's Hospital in Alberta. She is invested in helping kids to be active, as she often sees children with asthma at her clinic who have been told not to exercise because of respiratory problems. So I'm now going to pass it, pass the microphone over to Joanna, and uh, she will should be live now. Joanna, are you there? I am here. Perfect. I just use the controls at the bottom to move to the next slide. You do. That's right. Okay. Perfect. Um, thanks very much for um, having me come and um, chat today. I've just got um, a brief presentation, and I'm happy to chat afterwards and answer questions. 
So the first thing that I really wanted to emphasize is regardless of your special health needs, in order for us to have optimal health and well-being, we really need to have a good balance with respect to um, activity, nutrition, and sleep. And I think these are really the three key things um, that anybody needs in terms of maintaining health, and that's no different if you're somebody um, who happens to have asthma. The other thing that I wanted to highlight is that there really is a spectrum of um, childhood asthma. So this shows an upside-down pyramid. Um, at the top, you can see sort of the biggest block, 75% of children uh, would be classified as having infrequent or intermittent asthma. Some of the terminology has changed, but um, the groupings um, uh, sort of remain the same. Um, we have, um, uh, uh, so intermittent, infrequent intermittent asthma would mean that you don't have symptoms um, every day, that you have episodes, but then between that, you're well. Frequent intermittent asthma um, would be people who have um, more frequent exacerbations or symptoms, but again have periods when they are symptom-free. And then you can see that a small portion of children will have what's called termed persistent asthma, so symptoms likely on a daily basis. Um, I think this is important to consider um, because when we're looking at activity um, in, uh, in anyone with asthma, um, it's important to consider that there is a spectrum of disease, so the activity uh, recommendations may differ um, based on the type of asthma that you have. The next things that I wanted to highlight is there really are um, good recommendations out there for those of us who look after children um, and adults with asthma um, with respect to um, how we should um, go through care and um, advance medication. So this is a slide from the Canadian Respiratory Journal. Um, and there's been modifications over the years, but the format has really sort of stayed the same, and I really like this format. On the bottom, you can see in the blue, um, there's kind of a base that we all really need to build on. So first, we need to establish the right diagnosis, and there's different tools to help us do that. Then we need to look at are there possible environmental controls, such as reduction in exposure to cigarette smoke, um, to uh, pollens, um, dust mites, education with respect to what asthma is. Um, as well as the use of written asthma action plans. Um, for people with asthma, sort of the base with respect to treatment would be using um, as-needed bronchodilators. So often people are using things like Ventolin, also known as salbutamol. And then we really build on that. So if that's not enough um, to control symptoms, then we look at adding in other medications such as inhaled corticosteroids, uh, leukotriene receptor and um, antagonists, and other, um, uh, other medications. I'm not going to review that today. I think what is important is you can see that there's a gray line that says adjust therapy to achieve and maintain control. And that really covers the whole spectrum of medications that we're using. Um, and so what we're supposed to do as um, clinicians is work with patients to identify um, whether their symptoms are well controlled and adjust medications in order to um, allow them to do all the things that they want to do. So that raises the question of how do we um, determine um, what is good symptom control and how does that relate to physical activity? So this is also a slide from the Canadian Respiratory Journal um, that really outlines the different characteristics of asthma that um, people with asthma are probably asked about frequently by their, um, uh, their providers in order to establish whether their asthma is well controlled. And what I have highlighted here is the physical activity. So really our goal of asthma control is that you should be able to um, continue to do all the normal activities. So it should not be that your asthma symptoms are restricting your ac activity, but rather that your asthma um, treatment plan is modified in order to ensure that you can maintain normal activity patterns. So I just wanted to cover a few points today um, from a physician perspective, just in terms of why does exercise cause asthma symptoms? Should a child um, with asthma symptoms avoid exercise? Why is exercise important for children with asthma? Are there any cautions with exercise in children with asthma? And I have focused this on the childhood um, side of things. I realize that there may be other people. The information is relevant regardless of whether it's a child, adolescent, um, or um, adults uh, with asthma. So the first thing that I just wanted to touch base on is what happens to the airways during exercise. So the little, the man that I've got here on, on the screen, you can see on his left-hand side, there's a normal airway. You can see red bands that encircle this tube um, with a kind of purple interior. Um, the red bands around the outside are the smooth muscles, um, and the purple interior is the mucosa um, uh, of the airway. 
On his right side, you can see that this is um, a slightly different looking airway. So this is an uh, airway that may be characteristic of what we see in asthma. So what you can see is those red bands around the outside, the smooth muscle, are constricted. Um, and we often will refer to that as bronchoconstriction. Um, on the um, inside, you can see that the, the purple layer is no longer visible, but there's quite a thick layer um, as opposed to the thinner layer that you can see on the left-hand side um, that is the, um, the, the lining uh, of the airway. And then you can see yellow stuff in the middle, which represents mucus in the airway. So we know that asthma is caused by a combination of bronchoconstriction as well as inflammation in the airway. What happens normally during exercise is when we start to exercise, we have to be able to take bigger breaths to get more um, uh, air in and out um, in order to meet the demands of exercise. So the airway muscles actually, there's some relaxation in those airway muscles in order to allow that to happen. Um, so often while we're exercising, um, uh, there aren't problems, but it's really after we stop exercising that people with asthma can get into um, greater problems. So after exercise, those um, airway muscles can tighten again. Um, and also, as a result of exercise, we think that there's some drying out um, of the lining, the mucosa lining of the airways. And after exercise, there's a rebound. So there's an increase in mucus production um, to compensate for the water loss, um, the cold, uh, the temperature changes that happen potentially during exercise. So there are reasons why people with um, asthma are more likely to have um, symptoms um, related to exercise. So my short answer for the question, should a child with asthma or, or adult um, uh, asthma symptoms avoid exercise? And my short answer is no. Um, and I guess this goes back to my point in terms of that if um, there are symptoms, we should be adjusting controller medications in order to ensure that people can um, maintain their regular um, activity levels. The other thing that we know is that the more active you are, the less chance of asthma symptoms um, at the same activity level. So it's similar to anybody else um, in terms of developing fitness. If we are unfit, um, we haven't been doing a lot of activity, any amount of activity will result in you know, discomfort, restlessness, and other things. But the more fit we are, so the more activity that we participate in, um, we'll have less of those symptoms at the same activity level. And that's the same thing in people with asthma. The other thing that we know is that avoidance of exercise um, is unhealthy. So why is exercise important um, for people with asthma? So probably the most common thing that um, is mistaken for exercise-induced asthma is really being unfit. So if you're someone who hasn't been active, you will get short of shortness of breath. You may experience that chest tightness um, that someone with asthma could have. Um, so it's not uncommon for people who are unfit um, to wonder whether they do um, have exercise-induced asthma. Uh, being fit and active um, will help cope better with asthma symptoms. Um, and it also may actually improve asthma symptoms um, as well as um, have a positive benefit on the immune system. So there are fairly limited studies that have been done on this, but I think that there is some data to suggest that there are actually direct benefits of exercise um, on um, what causes asthma. Um, uh, the other thing is, um, as I mentioned before, that um, if you are um, a fit person, you will not have um, uh, symptoms at the same level of activity. So um, the, the more active that you are, the better you may be able to cope with some of the symptoms when you do have asthma exacerbations. The other thing that's important, and I know some people worry about this, um, is the relative benefit of having medications in order to be able to do all that you want to be able to do versus the negative benefits that medications um, can have on your, your um, health uh, when you're using them over the long term. And I think that the data does really support that the negative health impacts of inactivity is far greater than well-controlled asthma. So we should not be using exercise-related symptoms as a reason not um, to limit exercise uh, rather than increasing um, treatment of those asthma symptoms. Um, asthma is a, um, a serious disease that can potentially um, have uh, bad consequences. So we do have to recognize that there do need to be some cautions um, uh, applied. So about 70 to 90% of children will, with asthma will have exercise-induced symptoms. So I think 
um, like anything that you can anticipate, it's important to be prepared for that. Um, there are potential um, things that that may we may get more exposed to um, with activity um, that we can that we may need to consider about avoidance. So avoiding triggers. So if you are someone who is sensitive to pollens and there's a high pollen count, being active outside might not be the best idea. If you are someone whose symptoms get worse with exposure to cold, dry air, um, then again, using measures like using um, a scarf or a balaclava to try and reduce the exposure of your lungs to that cold, dry air may be helpful. The other thing that we do know is that warm-ups and cool-downs um, reduce the chance of um, symptoms related to asthma during activity. So we do recommend that rather than going from stop to into an activity that there is a period of warm-up at the beginning and the same thing at the end. And that probably helps um, the body sort of slowly adjust up and slowly adjust down at the end of activity. It's important that people be aware of their symptoms. Uh, obviously, some symptoms um, of asthma, like I've uh, pointed out, do sort of um, uh, are similar to what you see when you are working really hard. So it is important to be aware of the, um, the, the times where you're pushing yourself and maybe feeling a little bit short of that breath versus your asthma um, is maybe a bit more active and knowing when to take a break when necessary. Sometimes be hard um, with, with kids. Um, but I guess it's that balance in terms of us not wanting to limit the children, um, but really trying to help them learn when they do need to take a break. The other thing I think it's important is to talk to your doctor about using rescue medications before exercise um, and adjusting your preventers. Like I said, our goal is that you're able to participate normally in activity. Um, and for some people, it may be appropriate to take things like Ventolin prior to activity to reduce the chance of asthma symptoms. Um, lastly, I think it's really important um, that we, um, people with asthma, parents, um, uh, and the rest of us help in terms of educating teachers and coaches and other people who might be involved um, in supervising uh, people being active about asthma, as well as how that asthma impacts you as an individual. So what I said at the beginning is that there's different um, categorization of asthma, and I think it's important to remember that not all asthma is the same. and so. Um, the people that are supervising activity can't generalize from one child. So it's important that you um, uh, make those people who are supervising aware of um, uh, what, how asthma for your particular child or for yourself is being managed. The last thing that I wanted to, to do is um, just present a little bit of information in terms of um, uh, asthma and elite athletes. And this is by no means um, suggesting that this is our goal, is that everybody with asthma should be able to be an elite athlete. But I do think, um, as somebody who works with children, it's really important for us um, to help kids dream um, and to really look at what's important to them. Um, I know sometimes um, when we see um, children, we can sort of say, well, they don't you know, their ambition might be that they're going to be a world star soccer player, and that's why soccer is important, but that's an unrealistic goal. But I think for them that's important, and that I need to work with um, them um, and their family in terms of supporting them to be able to do all the things that they want to do today. Um, I, there are um, a number of uh, different uh, sports figures um, who use asthma medications, um, are well controlled, and are able to um, excel in terms of the sports that they, that they do. So I think it's just good. Um, to kind of make sure that we don't squash dreams. And that is all that I had to say. I'm more than happy to take questions or um, comments. Great, thank you uh, very much, uh, Joanna. So if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to type uh, the questions into the chat uh, box on your screen. Uh, we ha do have a few questions that were submitted in advance. Uh, so the first question was, uh, my son, who's 12, plays hockey, but the cold air makes his asthma worse. Any suggestions for minimizing his symptoms? Yeah, so I think it's a pretty common thing that happens. Um, as I mentioned, that one of the things may be if there's a possibility for him to have a bit of a warm-up before a game. That's often hard because with hockey, you're coming on and off the ice, so you're sitting and then getting back on the ice. So I realize that sometimes is not overly realistic. Um, the other thing that um, I have seen um, some players be successful with is they've used um, sort of a face guard. Uh, I think you can, um, you can buy them at a number of different sports stores that covers the nose and the face, where it really helps there to be something to warm up the air um, between the, um, the air um, 
uh, in the environment and before it's getting into the lungs. And most of them can fit reasonably well under a hockey helmet, so that's something to explore to see whether that's helpful. Um, and to be honest, it's really a matter for individual, because um, nothing works for everybody, so it's a matter of trying and seeing what um, may help. Okay, great. Uh, you mentioned uh, during the presentation about some of the challenges, uh, the different types of triggers uh, that uh, are present uh, for people with asthma when they're exercising. Uh, I'm wondering um, if you can talk about the impact poor air quality would have for people uh, exercising outdoors and, and any suggestions on uh, how, to, um, how to still be active uh, on days where the air quality might be poor. Yeah, I think that's a really uh, important thing. Um, depending on where you live, that can be more or less of um, an issue. Um, I worked in Sydney, Australia for a while, and the air quality there is very different than um, uh, um, some of the other regions in Australia, and we would see a big change with respect to asthma symptoms when people moved or left that, um, that particular area. I think, again, um, it's in terms of if you are um, aware that this is something that um, you're sensitive to, moving to inside activities, if at all possible, um, during that time period, or reducing the intensity of activity when the air quality is poor. Um, I think it's also um, a, uh, a big reminder that we all need to really advocate for things um, like improvements with respect to air quality monitoring and changes um, in, to help improve um, air quality, because it really does have a huge um, impact on a lot of people. Great. We have a question from Sandra, who's on the line. She says uh, she she said she read that swimming is the best sport for asthma. Uh, would you recommend it? Yeah, when I was doing a um, kind of a review of the literature before this presentation, it's one of the things that comes up in a lot of the um, the guidelines that you can find um, on the internet. Um, when I when I tried to look to see whether anybody had um, uh, looked at this more closely in terms of done studies on it, I couldn't find any. Um, it's really based on the fact that um, dry, cold air um, we know um, can, is something that irritates the airway. And so obviously with swimming, you eliminate that potential trigger. Um, there are actually some reports of, and it's more in the kind of elite athletes, um, that uh, some of the additives in the pool, chlorine, um, in some places in the world, uh, um, it's salt water. Um, some people have found that those actually make their asthma worse. So again, I think it's one of those things where if it's an activity that your child is interested or you or, you or your child are interested in um, and it doesn't make your asthma worse, then it may be a good um, option. So, um, I think it's just important to remember that there are some people that seem to be sensitive to the additives in the pool. Okay, great. I think we have one last question. Um, that was submitted in advance. A uh, person says, my daughter is only three and recently diagnosed. Is there a specific sport that is, uh, that is recommended or which might be easier or safer? Again, I think it does depend on the, on the triggers. Um, so um, I wouldn't, I guess from my point of view, I wouldn't um, limit activity based um, simply on a diagnosis of asthma. Um, if, if it's known that um, you're, as I mentioned, sort of sensitive to things in, in the pool or that outside you tend to have more symptoms but indoor activities um, uh, seem to be better tolerated, then I'd use those kinds of things to judge a choice and activity. The other thing is that um, any child is going to um, be more active in something that they enjoy. So I wouldn't limit things purely based on the asthma symptoms. Um, really, if it's something that they enjoy, they're going to um, participate. Um, it's going to uh, be a good experience for them versus choosing an activity, um, trying to minimize other things. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Joanna. Uh, I think that is it for questions uh, at this point, although there will be an opportunity uh, for additional questions at the end. Uh, we're going to move now to our second poll question, which you should see uh, up on your screen now. Uh, so the question is, uh, is your child or children with asthma currently uh, engaging in sports or exercise? So go ahead and, and answer the question on the screen. We'll give everyone a, a few minutes here to, uh, to respond.
Okay, we'll take a look now at our results. So uh, nice to see that uh, a majority, a more a significant majority of people uh, replying that uh, their their children are engaged uh, in exercise. Uh, so certainly uh, very happy to see that. So we will now uh, move on to our second uh, speaker, David Tellis Langdon. Uh, David is the chair of the Department of Kinesiology and Applied Health at the University of Winnipeg. He holds a Master's of Education from the University of Victoria and a PhD from Western University in Cognition and Learning. He teaches a course on adapting physical activity for people with disabilities and is the father of a physically active son who also has asthma. So we'll now uh, turn it over to David. Thanks, Noah, and, uh, and thank you, Joanne. I was at my desk furiously taking notes. As a parent of a, of a child with asthma, there's always new stuff to learn. So I, I was trying to think of what I could share today, and uh, being an educator, there are three things that I thought were critically important. The first one is getting yourselves educated as parents, and I did a lot of, of that work. I was lucky. Uh, I don't know if lucky is the right word, but my wife has asthma, and uh, so she was able to give, us, uh, give me some basic information when my son was diagnosed, but then I had to go and educate myself. It's also important to educate coaches as somebody who spends half their life coaching as well as uh, teaching at the university. If I have a child with a chronic disease, I need information from parents. Often I don't know what I need to, and certainly uh, coaches that haven't spent uh, much time with uh, children with disabilities are not even aware of what they need to know. And then it's also important to educate uh, the children with asthma that are the athletes about how to manage um, their own issues. So first off, as a parent, what I thought a parent needed to know about asthma in general and I had a little bit of information uh, when my son was diagnosed and got some more general information, but then I realized every child's asthma is different. Uh, my son has friends who have asthma and use different medications, use them differently. So it's also important to understand how your child's asthma might be different than a friend's and my son's asthma is different than my wife's. So uh, there was a lot of learning for me to do uh, as somebody without much background in asthma initially on how this actually works. Second point, how exercise impacts your child's asthma. Pay attention. There are uh, children, uh, as, uh, as Joanna said, they cough and wheeze sometimes for all kinds of reasons. They might be sick. Uh, they might just be worn out after a, a bout of exercise, but it might also be asthma. So we need to clear up and figure out what exercise is doing to impact our child's asthma. Uh, there is something, uh, Joanna kind of touched on this, a refractory period that some uh, children with asthma respond well to. Uh, it's a well-managed warm-up that takes about 30 to 40 minutes and provide, or sorry, takes about 15 to 20 minutes and provides you with sort of 30 to 40 minutes of protection. So we talk about that in our adapted physical activity course and try to encourage coaches to understand that if they have athletes with asthma, there's a possibility there, but it doesn't apply to all children with asthma. Look at the various physical activities that are going to be involved in whatever sport your child chooses. We talked a little bit about swimming. We've talked about cold. We've talked about outdoor air issues. Uh, all of these can be things that might impact um, a child's ability to participate effectively. And what are the training things that are involved so that you can probably pick up from the sport the kinds of things that people need to go through. And then lastly, what do coaches actually need to know about your child? So you prepare a list of things you want to talk to the coach about. Here's some of the tools. Now, I've, I've said first, ask your doctor for literature that you can understand. Uh, I have uh, an academic university background. I also luckily have access to all kinds of medical journals, uh, some of which I can read, many of which I have to go and talk to some of my colleagues to get information about what something means. I'm not a medical doctor. Um, and there's a whole range of stuff, including some things that I've already pulled off um, the website from uh, at asthma.ca, there's a great little document called uh, Breathe Easy, which was full of easy to follow and understand information, and then there's lots of stuff uh, on the website for the Asthma Society of Canada. So you grab as much information as you can and learn about asthma in general, and then don't forget to talk to your doctor about your child's specific asthma and what sort of important things there are to remember for that. Next, what do coaches need to know? Now, you may find you have a coach that has never dealt with anybody with asthma, so you may have to give them some general information about asthma, how, how it works, uh, and what sort of things they need to be aware of, and then a list of specific issues that might relate to your particular child. Some of the things that coaches need to watch for is when athletes are coughing and wheezing. It may be because they have a cold. It may be because 
it's been a rather strenuous activity. It may be because they have asthma. Also, sudden reductions in performance um, that are unexpected might be related uh, to asthma. I've touched on the refractory sp response uh, in the previous slide. Again, only if that's applicable. And then what should coaches do in case of exacerbation? They should know what they have to reach for, what your athlete has to reach for, and where they, should, uh, where they keep those kinds of things. Some of the potential triggers that uh, Joanne has already talked about, cold and dry air. Uh, I'm from Winnipeg, so we get lots of cold, dry air in the wintertime. Kids involved in outdoor sports, uh, there are issues in the wintertime. Also in the summer, there are various air pollutants, some outdoors, some indoors. There's uh, chemicals in, certainly in hockey arenas that may be triggers as well. Keeping eyes out for high pollen days. Uh, never used to worry about that on the weather report, and now I'm paying attention. For elite performers, and I'm thinking sort of Canada Games A uh, level and up, and Joanna touched on some high-performance athletes, uh, there are anti-doping regulations in place. My son just returned from the Canada Games, and I had to make sure that he had the paperwork necessary in order for him to use his asthma medications uh, and that they weren't approved, may not have been approved for other athletes. If you're uh, traveling, uh, uh, particularly across international borders, having various approvals for the medications with you when you travel and when you compete. Anything, any kind of event that would have doping regulations, uh, they're going to need the paperwork to know that it's appropriate for this athlete to be using these particular medications. Uh, try to make the coach's job as easy, and I've said here, as foolproof as you can. Uh, you'll see the picture on the, on the right of your screen. Pictures like that are available all kinds of places, and then you've noticed I've thrown some black circles onto it. We give something like this to our son's coach, showing here are the, uh, the medications that he has with him and a little bit of information about what they do. And then try to spend some time with the coach showing them exactly what medications the child has and what's the protocol to be followed, which one is a regular use, which one's an emergency use, and where they're keeping them. What the athlete needs to know I've said here as much as they can emotionally handle about their asthma. At various ages, they become more knowledgeable, and I think the trick here is to balance useful information versus anything that's going to get them upset and, and terrified and get them concerned about being physically active, as Joanna said. More activity is generally better. It's part of a healthy lifestyle, and to the extent that children can be active, it's a very good thing. Things that I've noticed that sports has helped with my particular son and other children that have asthma is they learn which inhalers they need, inhalers they need to use rather than having somebody hand, them, hand it to them. They've learned that it's important for them to ask specifically for a rest break when it's necessary. There are times when my son's been involved in team sports and he's needed more rest than some of his teammates. We've made the coaches aware of it, but he sometimes needs to remind the coach that he needs a break rather than waiting for the coach to make that decision for him and when he should stop participating entirely. Uh, this has also been important in his physical education class. There have been times he's had to say to his physical educator, I'm sorry, I need to take a break. I can't continue in this particular activity. Uh, other things is how to manage their warm-up. If, if they can access this refractory period, my son knows there's certain activities that he can do. Uh, people have joked about some of his funny antics, but he gets his heart rate up, and it, he's found this is to be helpful, and it allows him to per participate in certain activities longer than he might otherwise because he's done his own organized warm-up. When athletes travel, remember helping them to remember to pack their medications, where they keep their medications so they don't lose them because mom or dad may not be along on the trip to find them, and remembering to take them. Also, again, if we're talking about high performance, detailed paperwork for any anti-doping personnel that might be around. And finally, for athletes to travel, especially, and my son is now traveling to events without his parents, pack all the asthma medications together in a seat through pouch. I put a picture here, and here's some of the stuff that you might see in my son's kit. He can see what's in there. The coaches can see what's in there, and it's really easy to move it from place to place and make sure that it's accessible when he needs it. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, David. Uh, and so if you have a question that uh, you would like uh, David to uh, answer, if you could please uh, type your question into the chat box uh, on your screen. Uh, we do have a question that was submitted in advance. Uh, so a person wrote, my daughter's team has a number of children with specific concerns, uh, asthma, allergies, allergies, epilepsy, et cetera. Uh, the coach is a volunteer uh, who is a bit overwhelmed with so much added responsibilities. Uh, any suggestions or tools to help him understand my daughter's asthma without overloading him? 
Great question and probably true of all things. Uh, some of this stuff in the slide presentation, step-by-step -step, uh, process, uh, perhaps a binder, uh, if the coach had a binder where they could highlight in, in large letters each of the children's names so they've got a page. Uh, the asthma one certainly understanding what, um, what medications uh, that child has access to and make sure they're there and readily available so if they are needed, uh, you can get to them in a timely manner. Excellent. So are there any other questions? I see uh, a question here from Teresa. Uh, what about on extreme hot days, uh, where would one store medications uh, in an environment where it, it might be hot or humid or and cold, you, for example? And she's answered the question, well, cooler. Uh, Certainly having some kind of, uh, I have a very small, uh, actually I think I wanted it at a competition, it, it's a beer cooler, would take six cans of beer. Um, and as a coach, I take that along for anything that has to stay uh, cold. Uh, I, I haven't had to deal recently with anything that has to be refrigerated, but you can also throw a cold pack into that. Uh, and on cold days, uh, keeping it on your person somewhere where it will stay warm with body heat. Might also ask Joanna the question, she may have some answers to these as well. We'll unmute, or just unmuted, Joanna, if you have anything you want to add, uh, feel free to jump in at any point. Okay, thanks. Uh, so I have a, a question now from Heather. Um, Heather asks, uh, asks if, uh, she said she'd like to hear more about uh, the refractory period and, and asked whether there would be an example uh, of that. Uh, okay, well, I can, I can start just speaking personally for my son because I'm not an expert and then I certainly think we should hear from Joanna. Um, my son does about a 20-minute warm-up process. He's now got to the point where he, it sort of feels to him as though he's knocking on the door uh, of an asthma attack and then just backs off a little bit and tries to keep the pace up so that he feels he's just on the threshold. Uh, and if he does this for about 20 minutes, he can go pretty hard in a sporting event and probably has about a 30 to 40-minute window when his asthma really doesn't seem to kick in. And that's his, that's his personal experience. Joanna, do you have anything to, to add to that? Yeah, I would. Uh, um, what we generally recommend is something in the range of 15 to 20 minutes of a warm up, um, if possible, before starting to get um, into a sport. Um, I think from what David said, um, uh, it's really important to kind of figure out what works for you because the, the length of time and the type of activity that you need to do in order to kind of get your lungs, I guess, ready. Um, uh, is, is going to differ. So um, with younger children, we sort of, we recommend, you know, sort of a gentle warm-up. Um, I think they're probably not as um, able to perceive when things are, are changing uh, possibly, so it might be harder to figure out exactly what's working for them. Um, but it does, with a lot of these things, it is kind of trial and error in terms of trying to figure out what works for you or your child. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, another question here from Joyce. Uh, Joyce asks, uh, is there any evidence that children with asthma should follow different physical activity guidelines than healthy children? Uh, I'm going to start with none that I'm aware of, but I'd be very interested in what Joanna has to say. I would um, uh, echo that as well. Um, I, I think it's, uh, like I, I think both David and I have emphasized that activity is really important for good health. Um, and it's really a matter in terms of controlling symptoms in order to enable people to continue to um, lead active lives. Um, the health benefits of um, exercise, I think, are, are very clear. So I would not, um, I'm not aware of any um, guidelines that have different recommendations. So I think the standard recommendations um, in terms of physical activity guidelines uh, for children apply across the board. If somebody had asked earlier about specific sports, is this sport or that sport better? And my answer would be the same as it is to parents of most children. The child has to love doing the activity. Then they, they stick with it, they, they work hard at it, and they get better at it, and they have fun. Uh, telling somebody they have to do a particular activity because it's appropriate for um, their health usually means that they don't get excited about it, and then we don't get as much time in the sport. Any last questions uh, for either uh, David or Joanna? If you have anything else, just uh, enter them into the chat window. We'll give uh, another few seconds here for people to get any last questions in. Uh, 
I'm not seeing any other questions. So um, uh, first off, I want to thank uh, both David and Joanna for joining uh, us today for our, uh, our second uh, webinar in our series. Uh, and uh, to everyone who has uh, joined us as participants, thank you very much for, uh, for signing on. Uh, we appreciate that you've uh, stuck with us throughout the, uh, the webinar, and it looks like most people have. Uh, we will uh, be making announcements about uh, future patient-focused webinars uh, throughout that will be coming up throughout the year. So uh, please follow us on Twitter. You see the uh, Twitter uh, tag there, at Asthma Society. Uh, you can also sign up, if you aren't already, uh, to be a member of the National Asthma Patient Alliance at uh, www.asthma.ca slash NAPA, N-A-P-A. And that will uh, ensure that you uh, will receive all of the updates we have as far as future uh, webinars. Uh, I'll draw attention once again to our Team Asthma sign-up, uh, people who are looking to uh, get involved and, and run or walk with our Team Asthma program. Uh, we give out a free technical training Team Asthma t-shirt uh, for all of our members. So uh, if you would like to receive uh, one of our shirts and, and uh, participate with us at an upcoming event, please uh, log on and, and join Team Asthma at uh, asthma.ca slash Team Asthma. Uh, and also, you'll see an image here on the right of your screen, the Breathe Easy uh, Guide for Being Active and Healthy with Asthma. David mentioned it in his, his, in his presentation. Uh, you'll see the link to the exercise guide is in your chat window. Uh, and feel free to take a look at uh, that resource, which uh, we released last year. Uh, it currently is only available online, but we have uh, copies available in both English and in French. Uh, the last thing I will mention uh, as, a, as one last plug, uh, we will be doing another webinar this spring uh, on a topic to be announced. Uh, we hope also that uh, those of you that are interested will be able to join us for our Clearing the Air uh, conference, which is taking place May 4th and 5th in Toronto. Uh, this conference uh, is uh, it's our second annual World Asthma Day conference. Uh, World Asthma Day is on May the 5th, Tuesday, May the 5th, uh, which is the main day of our summit. Uh, this year's conference will be looking at the impact of climate change on asthma and allergies, and we uh, would love to uh, have you join us if you are able. Uh, to find out more information about that, you can visit clearingtheair.ca, and uh, the link to that is also uh, now in your chat window. Uh, for those of you who are not in Toronto and not able to attend, we are hoping to be able to uh, webcast a uh, majority of the day, so stay tuned uh, for announcements on that. So if there are no other questions, uh, we will say thank you very much to everyone once again and hope everybody has a wonderful day.